Reconciling Nautis, Assessing the Impact of Marginalism on Climate Change Cost-Benefit Analysis. A quick point about climate change. Last century, the jet streams were relatively steady and predictable. We would normally have a single polar vortex, and now there are often multiple ones. In the middle latitudes, jet stream volatility underpins extreme weather events, and the link between them and climate change is clear. None of this would have been considered normal 10 years ago. Climate change cost-benefit analysis attempts to inform and predict how the global economy will respond to climate change, and the modelling can be adjusted for different scenarios and policy settings. Originally I wanted to develop a new field called critical sustainability that looked at culturally embedded obstacles to sustainability. Unfortunately the tutors felt my generalised use of the term critical wasn't appropriate so I felt I had to move on. I've since looked into the origins of critical theory and in particular Horkheimer's work The Eclipse of Reason and early influences on Marx, specifically of Feuerbach. Uh, whose concern about reified abstraction I found interesting. After bouncing off critical sustainability, I had to look f around quickly for what to do next, because I wanted something that related to the broader topic of climate change. But I needed to combine that with a narrow question. I looked into the historical framing of the 2C target and found out some interesting things. The early modelling and the weaknesses identified at the time. On the original MIT-led team that developed the first global scientific consensus was a Russian scientist called Bordico, who identified the possibility of Arctic sensitivity and significant albedo feedback loop. The early 2C framework consensus included one major caveat. Bordico's work, <coughs> if accurate, would mean that the 2C framework would be in doubt. Arctic sensitivity has effectively collapsed the two-degree framework, and after global political consensus was achieved in Paris, the IPCC quickly started promoting the 1.5 degree target. I predict and advocate that this will give way to a general framework of climate emergency and doing all we can as soon as we can, supported by an MIT-led geoengineering program for the Arctic and globally coordinated carbon sequestration projects at scales similar to this one suggested by Professor Tim Flannery of a fish and seaweed farm roughly the size of Tasmania. While the situation seems daunting, the required response is within our technical and governance capabilities. Look into Nordis's work and develop my dissertation. Nordis was the sole voice in the field for a long time. He was recently given a Nobel Prize in economics, though it was alongside one of his biggest critics, Paul Romer. In the last 10 years, Nordis's work in climate change cost-benefit analysis has come under intensifying criticism. I review Nordis's contribution to the field and the recent criticism of his work and current debate. I enter into this debate by assessing the impact of marginalism on Nordis's DICE model and in this way address its weaknesses, some of which he himself has identified. These weaknesses extend across the climate change cost-benefit analysis field and economics more generally. After providing a brief background of the marginal revolution in the late 19th century, I will be taking key aspects of marginalism and matching them with elements of Nordis's model and demonstrate marginalism's impact and table these in an analytical matrix. I've developed three examples so far. Marginalism as part of the foundations of neoclassical economic thinking displaces at the theoretical level political economy, complexities of national interest and the specific interests of concentrated capital. Marginalism provides foundational support for neoliberalism, reinforcing a corporate-centric culture limiting analysis to market theory and aggregate analysis rather than focusing on detailed data. Marginalism has crippled outsourced the theory of value debate. Origins of the debate stretch back to Aristotle and the current theory is frozen in the mercantilist era with some opportunistic neoliberal add-ons to national accounting. For example, only since the 90s has finance been added to GDP. I answered the discussion of price model that includes a political economy dimension based on, based on a systems analysis of concentrated global capital by Vitaly et al. I propose looking at the progressive and incentivized elements within concentrated capital and propose potential actions in line with what I label a Montreal model approach based on the success of the Montreal Protocol. Thanks for listening.